Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. The show is about to begin. Dead or alive, you're coming with me. Welcome back. You are listening to Three Guys in a Flick. This is where we review the good, the bad, and the absurd. Tonight's episode, RoboCop. Beware, spoilers. Coming to you from the boardroom on the top floor of OCP, my name is Don, and to my right we have our comic book guy, John. Dick, I'm very disappointed. And to my left we have the professor, Ken. I'm sure it's only a glitch. (laughs) <laughs> all right all right how are you guys doing doing pretty good yeah looking forward to robocop are yeah. you yeah you're not though necessarily no that, not at all i'm feeling robotastic i'm sure you are this had john splattered all over it tonight is round six in the three guys search for the best classic 80s movie if you want to know what the previous entries are, you can go back and listen to the first five. But tonight we are talking about the 1987 RoboCop, released on July 17th, 1987. It was directed by Paul Vorhoven, written by Edward Neumeyer and Michael Miner. And it stars Peter Weller, Nancy Allen, Daniel O'Hurley, Ronnie Cox, Kirkwood Smith, Miguel Ferreira, and a bunch of other actors. So do you know which movie we have to thank for this movie? Terminator? No, Blade Runner. Yes, the writer was on set of Blade Runner, and of course we know Blade Runner is about a humanoid cop chasing after, or a human cop chasing after humanoid robots. So he thought, what would it be like to have a robotic cop chasing after uh, criminals? Yeah, well, and now we have the answer. But he was only sort of on set because he wasn't on set. He mm-hmm. was unofficially sneaking on to the set because it was a big production. And he just kind of sort of got himself, you know, uh, he just was like going in during his off time because it was on the same studio lot. And so he would just go in there and he could he could just slip in and nobody would pay any attention to him. And he said that he ended up eventually getting some of the uh, uh, background stuffs. Uh, he came up with his own little bits that were used on camera for, uh, you know, background set stuff. Oh, wow. Look at that. So this movie comes out in 1987. And I uh, remembered being so struck when this movie came out because of Ronnie Cox, because earlier, a uh, couple of months earlier, he does Beverly Hills Cop 2. And in Beverly Hills Cop 2, you know, he's this beloved character that's shot, and but he survives at the end of the movie. And so I only have these warm, friendly feelings for him. And then to come into RoboCop to see him be this, you know, total shark of a, you know, corporate asshole that is so ruthless, completely opposite of what he was in uh, the Beverly Hills, Hills Cop series, it was startling to me, and it was really interesting to watch him being the bad guy. Well, he is a dick. <laughs> Good one. Um, <laughs> uh, but he dresses just like Bogomil. Yes, he does. I mean, it's they're very in, interchangeable. It's like Bogomil got on an airplane, went to Detroit, and became this maniacal uh, corporate overlord. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, Ronnie Cox was good in this. How'd this movie do, Don? This movie was made for a modest $14 million, and it brought in $53 million. I guess it went way over budget. Originally, the plan was it was going to be made for like $8 million, and like halfway through the movie, they were already over budget, but they seemed to work it out that they actually got more money. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm sure a lot of that budget went to that fucking suit. So, and... You're talking about 1987, so I would say at least 90, 85% of that film is practical. Well, they you made, know what I mean? They made seven suits. Yeah. And the suits weren't even done by the time they started filming. They had to film all the scenes without RoboCop uh, because they had to wait on the suit, and they actually had to take a little break 
because the suit still wasn't ready after they had filmed all those scenes without him. But I read the, that the suits actually cost between $500,000 each to up to a million dollars. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me. Um, did you guys see this in the theater? Yes. I did too. Oh, huh. good for you guys. Did you? No. No. I saw this movie on VHS. It was all the rage. I didn't like it then. And I don't like it now. Is there a particular reason you don't like it? Oh, there's lots of reasons. But we'll get into that as we go through the, the plot. Curious. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Just not my thing. Which is ironic because it's science fiction. And it's action. Speaking of action, uh, we came up with our action movies, right? This was actually on my list, but this was way, way down there. You know, if I had to do a top 20, it would be on that list, but it would be further down. When we were negotiating our actual top 10 that we were going to review, I had to kind of fight to get this one on the list. Uh, You didn't have to fight the professor. He was all for it. I know, but fight you. Yeah, well, yeah, but obviously it wasn't that big of a fight because you won. Yeah. Which is doesn't happen always, listeners. <laughs> Paul Verhoeven directing this movie, it was his one of his first big movies that he got to do that really got him some recognition. He was considered an unknown, and he had a, a very modest uh, flop of a movie that didn't necessarily uh, win people over other than it is a little on the gory side. That flesh and blood movie? Yeah. And, and so he is brought on board, and I got to say that I, I can't think of RoboCop now without thinking of Paul Verhoeven because of the, the luxurious nature of his gore that he has. He's very splashy and, and not necessarily, I wouldn't say necessarily in a gratuitous way, but he, he's not shy o- about having, you know, splashes of blood and squirts of blood. Yeah, he definitely wants to get your attention. Yeah. yeah. And that's what he does. And this kind of, as you're saying, Professor, set the template for his future movies like Total Recall and Starship Troopers. Mm -hmm. He also did uh, Showgirls and Basic Instinct. Those were probably the the most, uh, of these movies we just mentioned, that's probably what he's most known for is this bit. And so, you know, this 10-year period, this is Paul Verhoeven. Did you hear about his tantrums on set? I heard that he was a very highly stressed person that was always yelling at everybody and he wanted it more, he wanted it faster, he wanted it bigger, he wanted it louder, just never happy with what was offered, always wanted more. There is a special on Netflix, our series called The Movies That Made Us, and you can actually watch kind of the behind the scenes of RoboCop in that series, and all the cast members agree that you know, some of them were just willing to walk out at certain points because of his anger issues. He would throw tantrums where he would just sit down and start yelling, you know, you're trying to fuck me, you're trying to fuck me, or you're fucking my movie, you're fucking my movie, and he would shout at people. At one point, he had an argument with Peter Weller that was so bad that he basically fired Peter Weller during the filming of the movie, and then eventually they worked it out and brought him back. Speaking of Peter Weller... Uh, Mr. Robocop, what else do we know him from? We know him from The Adventures of Buckaroo Ban- Banzai. Oh, that's right. And that's about it. He had done some dramas and some other stuff before that, but never, I think this was his second technically action flick. Did you mm-hmm. ever see uh, Shakedown or Leviathan? Yeah. Oh, Le- Le- That was two of his 80s movies. Yeah. Shakedown with Sam Elliott. Mm-hmm. Yeah, how you like them apples. Did you hear who else they were considering casting in this movie? Uh, yeah, and I was actually kind of surprised. Uh, Arnold, naturally. Uh, Michael Ironside. Yeah, that was their original pick for RoboCop can was you, Michael Ironside. Can you imagine Michael Ironside as uh, RoboCop? I thought I think he would have done a great job, but I think, was he too mm. short for the role? Maybe. I, I don't know if I would have liked him as... Uh, it would have been uh, a darker uh, RoboCop, I think. Uh, maybe. I mean, what, what about you, Michael Ironside? Mm. Yeah, yeah, right? Redger Hauer, which yeah. makes more sense than Michael Ironside, in my head. Uh, Tom Berenger, Keith Carradine, and James Remar. Do you guys remember who James Remar is? I don't. Uh, 48 Hours, he is the bad guy. Oh, okay. He's been a bad guy in a bunch of stuff. Anyways, I think he would have made probably the best choice outside of... Uh, well, Peter they, Weller. They came really close with Arnold Schwarzenegger. And did you know why they didn't use Arnold Schwarzenegger? It's too big. 
They said that when they designed the costume, like the drawing of him in the costume, he looked like the Michelin Man. So did you know about the particulars of Peter Weller playing RoboCop, some of the things that like he did to get into the role? Yeah, I guess months before uh, they started filming or, or shooting, he uh, got an instructor at Juilliard. And it what was, was the instructor? Basically, it was basically a mime instructor. That's yeah. not what it was called, but that's what basically yeah. it was. And he learned how to walk and act like a robot. Two months, this guy is putting in the work. Right, gets to set, puts on the fucking suit, and can't move. I guess they said that he almost had a breakdown, and they had to shut down production so he could learn how to move. Um, and you know, good thing they did because the way he moves as RoboCop, I mean, it looks like he's a fucking robot. So, yeah. The other thing I read too is that while he was on set, Peter Weller, especially when he was in the costume, insisted on everybody because he, I guess, gets into his characters and is his characters. They had to call him Robo, and yet nobody on set would refer to him as that, and it really angered him. What do they call that? Method acting. Being a method actor. That's right. Kirkwood Smith, you guys familiar with that 70s show? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Red. Yeah. Red Foreman. I got to say, um, yeah. All my all my feelings toward this movie aside, I think that Kirkwood Smith probably does one of the best jobs in this film because he's an asshole, but he's a subtle asshole. But he's not only a subtle asshole; he is a fucking asshole. He's a sarcastic right? kind of and sadistic, a, sadistic with a slightly humorous yeah, edge to him. But I thought he did really well, which you know, he uh, every time he was on screen. I had to chuckle a little bit. I read that uh, the glasses, the reason why he wore those round glasses is it made him look like a famous serial killer. Oh, I can see that. I can see that for sure. Hmm. Are you guys uh, familiar with Miguel Ferreira? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, young in this. This is a, probably one of yeah. his first films. Yeah. I, this is where I first recognize him. Yeah. Uh, I probably recognize him most from TV. He's done a lot of TV yeah. and like miniseries and things like uh -huh. that. But he's always been a fun actor, you know. And, and I thought that he played the hippie, uh, up and coming uh, junior executive, whatever he is. I thought he was uh, really good for the role. Did you hear who they wanted originally to play Lewis? Uh, Stephanie Zimbalist. And where do we know her from? Remington Steel. Did you ever watch that series? Yeah. Uh, a couple times. Yeah, I liked that series. Which is ironic because she couldn't do Robocop because of Remington Steel. And around the same time, Pierce Brosnan couldn't do James Bond because of Remington Steel. Hey, Professor, did this movie win any awards? It did. It won an Academy Award for uh, sound, editing, sound editing. And it was nominated for uh, film editing. And it was also nominated for um, overall sound. Yeah, I guess it lost to the last, last emperor that year. In the near future dystopia, Detroit is on the brink of societal and financial collapse. Overwhelmed by crime and dwindling resources, the city grants the mega corporation Omni Consumer Products control over the Detroit Police Department. OCP Senior President Dick Jones demonstrates Ed 209, a law enforcement droid designed to supplant the police. Ed 209 malfunctions and brutally kills an executive, allowing ambitious junior executive Bob Morton to introduce the chairman, the old man, to his project, RoboCop. Meanwhile, Officer Alex Murphy is transferred to the Metro West Precinct. Murphy and his new partner, Ann Lewis, pursue notorious criminal Clarence Bodiger and his gang, Emil, Leon, Joe, and Steve. The gang ambushes and tortures Murphy until Boddicker fatally shoots him. Morton has Murphy's corpse converted into RoboCop, a powerful and heavily armed cyborg with no memory of his former life. RoboCop is programmed with three prime directives. Serve the public, protect the innocent, and uphold the law. A fourth prime directive, Directive 4, is classified. So what do you think of the opening of this movie? It opens uh, looking at the downtown city. You have this somewhat ominous music playing, and then it cuts to the uh, news feed. Oh, yeah, the news feeds. Um, the first news feed, I don't mind, because it's uh, an opening narration, and it kind of sets the stage and lets us know where we're at. We're in a futuristic uh, Detroit. We know that old Detroit is not a nice place to be. A shithole. A shithole. Thank you. 
God, I don't know why the words escaped me. But this news feed brought us all up to speed. Uh, after that, all the other news feeds we got, yeah. So the, the news feed also briefly shows us uh, Dick Jones and Clarence Bodiger. And Murphy is then uh, introduced to us, and she arrives at the precinct. He arrives. Oh, sorry. He. Well, the one thing that I thought was interesting was uh, don't they first do the boardroom scene and then Murphy arrives at the police department? Because one of the things we get is after the whole Ed 209 fiasco, which we should talk about, uh, happens and Bob runs up to talk to the old man, he mentions briefly that they're already making progress on their Robocop thing by uh, making sure to transfer certain officers who fit a certain profile that'll work in the Robocop uh the RoboCop program. So this kind of leads into this is why Murphy has been transferred to that specific police department because they figure more cops are going to be killed there. Ah, uh, maybe, maybe. Uh, but yeah, we do. We get into the boardroom and they're talking about crime in the city and OCP is the big conglomerate that you know runs the uh, runs the city and they are proposing to knock down old Detroit get a, a clean slate and they're going to call it delta city or mm-hmm. i guess the plan is is it's going to be the first city in america that is corporate run almost outside of the united states yeah well whatever it is it's um they're redoing it right mm-hmm. so they need to clean up the area and but the police force is overworked and they're threatening to go on strike and crime is uh, out of control so ocp and dick jones they come up with ed 209 and this is where they uh, give the live demo. What did you think of Ed 209? Uh, it's fucking, well. You're uh, not a big fan of the stop motion? No, 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 no. Stop motion, I'm fine. You know who did the stop motion? Uh, I, I know he's done a bunch of movies, in fact. Uh, well, the, he's, uh, well, I'm thinking of one particular movie that kind of launched everything. But Star Wars? Yep. Phil Tippett. Yes, he yeah, did Phil the Tippett, ass that's right. and other things. Yeah. yeah, no, the stop. And the Rancor. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the stop motion, I'm fine with stop motion. It's fine. Uh, I didn't like the design. And I don't know. I just, how do you design a uh, peacekeeping robot that can't go up and down stairs? That was pretty pathetic. I think that was part of the humor of it. They were actually kind of added in as like a comedic element. Because Ed 209, for as much as you know, he's on the posters and everything, doesn't appear a lot in the movie. And in fact, the first version of it had eyes. But they thought it made it look too funny and goofy, so they took the eyes off. Yeah, well, whatever. It fucking dumb. Um, so they go into this boardroom, and Dick Jones is like, "All right, let's 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 have a uh, demonstration." And he gives this one dude a gun and says, "Point it at Ed Two Hundred Nine." And Ed Two Hundred Nine turns off and impresses everybody, and everyone's like, "Ooh ah." And he tells him to drop the gun. And so naturally, you drop the fucking gun. Yeah, right? 20 seconds to comply. That's 15, right. 15 seconds to comply. And then he drops the gun. And then... The countdown continues. And then I <laughs> I thought it was kind of funny that the guy who who this is happening to, he starts running. And when he runs behind people, Ed 209 follows him, right? He's tracking. But, yeah, he's tracking him. And so inevitably, uh, Ed 209 just unloads on this guy. One of the... F- not, I don't know if it's a funny thing, but one of the things about this scene is that uh, originally when Ed 209 unloads on this guy, and it's brutal, I mean, just shoots him up like crazy, the scene was longer by like five or ten seconds of more brutality of him getting shot to the point that the movie got slapped with an X rating. So they just removed like five seconds of the gore from that and got down to the R rating. They had to go before the MPAA 12 times. So yeah. it was more than just that scene. Yeah. But, but I know that's one of the scenes that they cut down. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, well, any you could probably pick out all the scenes that they had to cut out. A question for you. Why does he have live ammo? That's a good question. Because it's a live demonstration. Yeah, spoken like a true corporate guy. And I I don't know. The he, It just keeps going and going and going and going. I would have thought that body would have been shredded. Yeah, it, it should have been like, it should have been like shredded cheese. Right. Yeah. So obviously this is a tragedy. And um, did you think it was a little bit of, I don't know, foreshadowing that there was, you know, so much blood shot or so many times the guy was shot and he bled all over the city, the model. 
No, because we never see that. Well, we, we see him crash onto the model. We see him laying no, 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 on the no, model. No, 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 no. We, we, we never, don't see the blood. What, what, oh. what, what's it foreshadowing? That there's going to be a lot of blood in the city. The new city? We, Just, never, we never see the new city. Okay. And that's what, I mean. Um, I, I mean, it could be. How about that? What do you think of the old man's reaction? <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Not that, oh my God, just what happened is, I'm very disappointed. Yeah, but I, I think Dick's response is fucking hilarious. It's just a glitch. A glitch? And but if you look at the old man's res, uh, response when he says it too, he kind of thinks, what the fuck are you talking about? Well, the old man just saying, Dick, right. I'm very disappointed. <laughs> so this is a great opportunity for Bob, uh, one of the junior executives, to pitch his idea of RoboCop to the old man. And he does, he, he finds the moment of weakness and exploits it and he gets his shot. And like you were saying, they have to wait for someone to either volunteer or someone to die essentially. Well, they but even, everything else is ready to go. They don't even need volunteers because they worked when the OCP took over the police departments, they worked into the police agreements that they signed away their rights if they died. So they could do anything with their bodies once they were dead. Right, but they also said uh, we don't have any volunteers. Yeah, but so, they didn't need them. Well, Morton says, now we just got to wait for some poor bastard to volunteer. And I guess by that he meant die? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Well, there you go. And now we're back at the police station where Murphy and Lewis had already met, and they're getting ready to go out on patrol. Uh, this is... Uh, something that is going to be common in Verhoeven's movies, uh, co-ed locker rooms. Yeah. Did you notice that? Yeah. Progressive for his time. Mm-hmm. Very much so. He yeah. did that too in uh, Starship Troopers, didn't he? That's what I just said. <laughs> he said it's common in his movies. I'm yeah. pointing out the movie that it was common in. Well, in, also in Showgirls. Well, oh, yeah. I don't yeah. remember in Showgirls it was co-ed. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You, sl- you saw Dong in Showgirls. Mm. Don't act like you didn't look. I don't know if I saw that movie. <laughs> That's another one, Professor. Put it on the list. Okay, got we're, it. We're doing showgirls. <laughs> Elizabeth Berkeley. Oh, I was going to say shoe. <laughs> yeah, Elizabeth yeah. Berkeley from yeah, uh, Saved by the Bell. Jesse. Jesse Spano. Getting naked, dancing on the pole. So, what did you guys think of Lewis? Uh, not my favorite. Bland. Overacting. I, I thought she did okay in the role i don't think she yeah i I agree with you she was a little bit vanilla kind of in this role hard to believe as this supposed to be this badass cop kind of in a man's world you know holding her own do you know what she did for her method acting to get into this role no what's that she wore men's underwear oh tidy whities probably to help her feel more masculine Mm -hmm. interesting i gotta say out of all of our hero characters the only one i really liked was the captain Sergeant Reed? or I'm sorry, yeah. The only one I liked was Sergeant Reed. He was a good cop. Yeah, I liked him. But all the other ones, I dig or leave it. Yeah, all the other cops were forgettable in this movie. I meant all the heroes. Oh, all the heroes? Yeah. Uh, The bad guys were way more entertaining for me than anything else for this. But that's just me. So Lewis and Murphy are going out on patrol. Mm -hmm. And they... They get a call. That... A burglary is in a bank progress? has just been robbed. Uh, thank you. A bank has been robbed, and it turns out it's uh, Clarence Bodiger's gang, and so they chase him to the old steel mill. How do? What do you think of this chase scene? For starting out, first of all, with the whole burned money, so we get a, get a sense that Clarence is pissed off already, and he's an asshole. Uh, what do you think of the chase scene? There's a chase scene. You didn't think it was a, it was compared to some of our other chase scenes? It was actually not a bad one. I liked the setup of, you know, these cops obviously kind of, you know, you get the impression right away they know what they're doing because when the doors of the van open up, you know, right in the beginning, the cops have already pulled around to the side. So it was kind of a neat little trick that you expected them to be there. Yeah. I just thought that this is a pretty shitty place to be a cop because – they they have they have found the the van that's uh, the from the getaway of the robbery, and police dispatch tells them that it's fifteen minutes before they can get back up. Yeah, but they decide to go. Eh, let's do it anyway. Yeah, and so holy moly, what do they do? They get they get one of them outside the car shooting. Holy moly, this is crazy cop town time. I think the best part of this bit for me during this whole chase is when uh, Bobby gets shot and then Clarence asks him if he can fly and he throws him out of the uh, of the van as a diversion. That's cold. Yeah. Well, I mean, Clarence didn't fucking care. 
mm-hmm. you know. But it didn't stop them, and they were able to track them to the steel mill. And, yeah, 15 minutes. Why do you not wait for backup? Yeah, they get to the steel mill, and now backup is only 10 minutes away. Oh, is that what it was? And They choose to go in? Yeah, you, you saw the doors open. You know there's multiple uh, suspects. There could be more at the mill. And there could be more at the mill, and they're all armed, obviously. But, uh, yeah, they go in pretty recklessly, and I don't know, this this wasn't all that exciting for me either. Uh, but I will say, uh, once the, the gang gets the drop on Murphy and Lewis, it gets pretty fucking dark, and it gets pretty fucking brutal. Well, before that, when Lewis goes to take out the, uh, the henchman who's taking a piss, we get introduced to, I think, one of the best laughs in uh, in some of these action movies you didn't what did you think of it when the guy threw lewis off the cliff and has that laugh did you think of anything of that no i thought it was annoying oh i thought it was a pretty good one i kind of like the moment where she blows a bubble with her bubble gum and when the bubble pops then the stream of piss stops yeah i understand it and i get why it's there uh that gang is supposed to be really unruly and you know uh just just bad guys, I guess. But for me, the the laugh kept going. So I, I just... I don't know. Go. This whole scene I thought was important in that she was supposed to get the high ground so that when Murphy got, you know, got the detention of all the other guys, she's the one who would have the gun on them, be able to take them all out. But when she was taken out of the picture, Murphy obviously was left alone. So yeah, inevitably... Murphy gets captured, and then they fucking blow him away. What would you think of this whole blown away sequence, the the graphic nature of it, um, with Clarence and everything kind of trying to add in a little bit of humor again about the hand and all that? It was brutal. Yeah. You know, Clarence definitely is the bad guy of the film. I don't know. It was just brutal. I don't know if I can recall seeing before this another action movie maybe even a horror movie that was this graphically brutal in a killing scene, especially of a killing a cop. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I mean, watching the hand leave, and then that's a nice, healthy squirt of blood that leaves, and then we see the arm get blown off, and then he gets shot, like, what, 40 times? Holy shit, from four shotguns? He should be, he should be mincemeat. And here is where the wheels fall off. How does he not die? I His don't, will to live. I don't get, bullshit. Get that either, because the exclamation point is the shot to the temple, right? I'm pretty. I'm pretty sure you can see in the back of the fucking in the back of his fucking head. And how in the world do they take him to the hospital? Because he still might be alive. Yeah. See again. That's in, where the will. This is the future. There, there, doesn't make it right. There, there's no. Doesn't make way, it good. There's no way that he is on his way to the hospital with a fighting chance or even a pulse. Right. Did you read the story behind the trauma team that worked on him? No. That was actual hospital trauma team who just ad-libbed that whole scene. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they did a pretty good job. So it goes dark eventually with him on the table. And then after it's dark, we see a little bit of static. And then for the next uh, three minutes or so, we get various TV screenshots. I read that originally uh, the director wanted to be 15 seconds of dark, but then people said people might think the movie's over or there's a problem with the movie and start getting up to leave. So then they negotiated down to be was going to be 10, 10 seconds and then down to five seconds. But I thought it was a clever way to kind of start to introduce us to the idea of this RoboCop. What do you think of the introduction? I thought it worked. I mean, it, in a in a, in a uh, 1980 sort of way, it worked for that time period. Yeah, I thought it was fine. I mean, they kind of give us a whole transition. At first, we're just kind of seeing through his eyes as the screens are coming down. Then the first time we really get a glimpse of him is when he gets up and starts to walk. We're still looking at through his eyes, but you see him kind of a, a picture of him on, a video a, of, on, a on the monitor. Mm-hmm. The next time is through the frosted glass then behind some bars, and then we finally get to see the whole one, I think, at the shooting range. I think so. Well, we do get to see him through the cage, you know, as he is being put back into his chair. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I will say that uh, when he walks, the sound it makes, 
I kind of dug that. In the police station, cool. it ha- yeah, it, in the police station, it has that nice heavy clunk to it as each step hits, but that step does not stay consistent throughout the rest of the movie. Correct. Uh, you know what it reminded me of? Hmm. The power loader from Aliens. Oh mm-hmm. sure, sure. Just that clunk. Yeah, the thunk as you as you put it. Yeah. What do you think sure. of his gun at the shooting range? Uh, probably my only favorite part of the character. Mm-hmm. I, I like uh, I like his holster. I'm not going to lie. I like how his, his leg, leg yeah, pops open and he, he does the whole little twirly thing, um, which must be common with cops in the 80s because, you know, <laughs> Cobra did it first. Uh, but, yeah, it was okay. How, how many bullets do you think that clip has in his gun? I don't think it is uh, a clip, and I don't know if they're even bullets. That thing never runs out. Mm. No, it doesn't. And it fires like a fucking machine gun. So it's got to be a lot of rounds. It's like semi-automatic. Yeah. And then we are introduced to his prime directives. We have Morton saying, all right, how does he say it? He starts out with... Uh, what are your prime directives? Is that what he says? Yeah. And then he says, serve the public trust, protect the innocent, and uphold law. Or is it the law? <laughs> uphold the law. <laughs> Did you hear where they got that first directive from? Serve the public trust? Yeah. No, where? They found that in a fortune cookie. Oh, did they? Yeah, the writer. <laughs> That's funny. Um, I got to say, this fourth prime directive, fucking brilliant on the mm-hmm. part of Very clever. Dick Jones. Of Dick, yeah. Yeah. RoboCop is assigned to Metro West and hailed by the media for his brutally efficient campaign against crime. Lewis suspects he is Murphy, recognizing the unique way he holsters his gun, a trick Murphy learned to impress his son. During maintenance... RoboCop experiences a nightmare of Murphy's death. He leaves the station and encounters Lewis, who addresses him as Murphy. While on patrol, RoboCop arrests Emil, who recognizes Murphy's mannerisms, furthering RoboCop's recall. RoboCop then uses the police database to identify Emil's associates and review Murphy's police record. RoboCop recalls further memories while exploring Murphy's former home. His wife and son had moved away following his death. Elsewhere, Jones gets Boddicker to murder Morton in revenge for Morton's attempting to usurp his position at OCP. Robocop tracks down the Boddicker gang and a shootout occurs. He brutally assaults Boddicker, who confesses to working for Jones. Robocop attempts to kill Boddicker until his programming directs him to uphold the law. He attempts to arrest Jones at OCP Tower, but Directive 4 is activated, a fail-safe measure to neutralize RoboCop when acting against an OCP executive. Jones admits his culpability in Morton's death and releases an ED-209 to destroy RoboCop. Although he escapes, RoboCop is assaulted by the police force on OCP's orders and is badly damaged. Lewis helps RoboCop to escape to an abandoned steel mill to repair himself. So his first night on the town, he's pretty busy. Yeah, what does he do? I got a question. What makes you think that, okay, here's my new prototype weapon, police officer RoboCop, and you're just going to let him go out solo on his own, unattended? Where's the beta testing? Where's the data? I, I, I just This is a big lawsuit waiting to happen. Look what just fucking happened to Ed 209. Well, we don't know what kind of testing they did while he was being built up. Yeah, we do. None. There's they n- just sent him out there. There's just no reason that he should go out by himself without somebody else with him. Or maybe not even with him. Maybe maybe show us uh, somebody monitoring him. Sure. Maybe they- a van following or something. But I figured- on the other hand, and the flip side of that coin is he should be perfect. Right? He should be the cop that they designed. And, you know, he goes out and realistically their gamble paid off because that first night he did okay after what we saw happen in the boardroom with the ed 209 i don't think they give a fuck maybe so we we get uh him intervening in a mom and pop holdup, and the 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 bad guy he's got a shotgun no it's it's a machine gun He's got a machine gun, and robocop comes through the doors and next thing you know he's trying to shoot robocop to no avail, and then he, what does he do? He breaks the gun, and then he throws him into a cooler, and then after that, he turns to the the, uh, the shop owners. Thank you for your cooperation. Good night. 
and then he leaves. He doesn't arrest the bad guy. Eh, I'll just leave him in the cooler. Maybe, maybe he calls for backup, and they got to wait twenty minutes. Um, he's got a modem in his head. I'm sure. He, I'm, yeah, I'm sure he's got a modem in his head. But here's my thing: if I'm a bad guy and I see that he's fucking metal, why am I wasting the ammo? I don't know, but the guy. What's the line that he says throughout that whole scene? Who the guy? The the bad guy. Fuck me. He was only supposed to say that once. And he just kept repeating it over and over again, and the director loved it. Well, I probably would say the same fucking thing if I saw RoboCop coming after me. But, yeah, and also, look at all the damage he did. Mm -hmm. If I'm on the mom and pops, I'm fucking pissed. Team America. (laughs) Fuck yeah. Well, the other thing I was thinking of was when the guy's shooting him, you know, in the chest and everything, and it's not really doing anything, aren't those bullets probably ricocheting? Right. Yeah, again, I'd be pissed. I was expecting them to like zoom out and we'll see that the mom and pop owners of the place are dead somewhere. A couple of, you know, people shoppers are all, you know, dead over in the beer aisle. Probably. He's 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 just fucking causing carnage. It would have been fun to have a, a, a Matrix lobby scene moment of the tile sliding to the floor after they leave and go up the elevator. Same thing, RoboCop walks, walks out of the shop and we you see something just like collapse. Like, all the aisles like glass, uh, the leftover glass from the thing that he threw him in right? something just like kind that of falls yeah yeah but yeah what the heck he he destroys the place yeah send us the bill mm-hmm. well you know we we didn't talk about it the must-haves for our 80s movies but we figure by round six you should know them uh over the top right over the top action if anything Ro- uh, robocop is definitely over the top action for days mm-hmm. uh lots of explosions Yep, this one has lots of explosions, but you know excessive force. Oh, absolutely right. And then and now, uh, he leaves the he leaves the robber in the cooler, and he's going on patrol, and we get the RoboCop theme as he's driving, looking around like the Terminator, and um, the hey. next one are the rapists, right? Yeah, but fun fact: each time that RoboCop is driving around in his police car, he's too big for the suit. He can't sit in the police car. The in, actor, yeah, in his suit. He doesn't have any pants on. Yeah, yeah. I guess he was in tidy whities Yeah, with just the upper half on. Yeah, I heard that. I heard that. Um, so yeah, you, you get the two, uh, the two asshole guys that are, are are terrorizing a woman, and then we see the headlights show up on on you know onto them, and then the brick wall is all lit up, and then we see the silhouette of RoboCop. Okay, yeah. And, you know, the targeting bit and him getting shoot in the dick. I thought that was pretty funny. Your move, creep. And did you notice the partner, the guy in the back, as soon as dude got shot in the dick, he immediately dropped to the ground and said, oh, I'm, I'm, I give up, I give up, I give up. I'm good. I mean, if you saw that, wouldn't you drop to the ground? I don't want to get shot in the dick. Mm. Fuck that shit. And the fact that he was willing to take that shot. Yeah. Right between her legs through her dress. Well, I mean, it was all calculated. I mean, well, I think they show later that he has the uh, thermal imaging, so he could see. Oh yeah, no, no, no. I, right I, I, yeah, I assumed all of that. Right, mm-hmm. I saw Predator. Yeah. I, I get how masks work. And mm-hmm. then years later, Tony Stark would do the same thing. And did you like? Bam, tied in the MCU. And did you like his uh, reaction to the point of "You've been through a crisis. Shall I contact the rape clinic?" Yeah, or? very, a very canned answer response type thing. Definitely a robot. Yeah, and then it's on to City Hall. And we get down to City Hall, and the police have the whole front of the building cordoned off with SWAT. And then we see, and then we see Murphy, or we see RoboCop roll in, drives right through the yellow tape right up to the front. Keep them talking. And he walks upstairs. Did you know that this whole scene was actually based off of a real life crisis, where uh, former San Francisco supervisor Dan White wanted his old job back so he took a bunch of hostages so i guess uh the character in the movie is seen eating baby ruth bars which is an homage to the fact that uh when dan white took his hostages i guess he was eating twinkies all the time oh so yeah. they're just trying to replay that incident yeah well you write what you know or yeah. what you read about what'd you think of that whole hostage situation it was a hostage situation did you know that when uh RoboCop uses his thermal imaging. They didn't use any like special computer effects for that. No, they did it all on film. No, they painted the people. They painted the people. Yeah, they painted them to look like they were doing thermal and just use colored lights and everything. I read that when they were 
figuring out that scene to actually get the thermal imaging would have cost too much. So they decided just to paint the people. Yeah, well, you do what you got to do to get the shot, Mm -hmm. right? So, yeah, so he pulls the gunman through the wall, and then next thing you know, RoboCop, oh, no police brutality here. We're just going to go ahead and pitch you right out the window. Yeah. Which is foreshadowing. RoboCop has a habit of sending people through the window. Didn't you like how the cameras follow the body right down to the ground? Yeah. Then we get a uh, another police, or uh, then we then we get another uh, news uh, cast where we get to see a little bit of happy good news about the good that RoboCop is doing in the community. Yeah, the additional news clips. Yeah, they, they had a they had a couple of goofy commercials mixed in with a couple of the news clips as well. Yeah, and you know, I it just wasn't my thing. That's what, fine. What are you going to do? I think, again, maybe, you know, like you said, it was unnecessary, but I think what they were trying to really focus on at this point, you know, by this act of the movie, is that he's purely robotic and his humanity is gone. That um, he's just a robot at this point. Yeah, but he starts to get his humanity back. Um, he goes in for sleepy time, I guess. He mm-hmm. gets plugged into the chair. And this is where he starts remembering uh, his former life. Um, and he then, has his nightmare. Yeah, yeah, he has a nightmare. And they're like, he's dreaming and he has old memories and this, that, and the other. Can we jump back also briefly to one scene before where we get a showdown, if you will, of sorts between uh, Dick Jones and Bob Morton in the executive lounge? And I thought that this was a, a wonderfully ruthless moment for Dick Jones, how he uh, puts his hand up to his uh, Morton's cheek and he grabs his hair and just yanks hard. And didn't wash his hands. No, he didn't. But who hasn't had a you know, corporate experience like that? Oh, exactly. I mean, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I thought it was amusing that of all the things they could have had Dick Jones doing, he was taking a shit. He was taking a shit while these guys are talking shit about him. And, it, you know, it, it's a classic, um, you know, the bosses in the room type scenario. Because you see all the other employees just rush out. I know. Right? When they start talking about Dick, they all run well, it's, out of it's when he walks out of the stalls when they all leave. Cause no, like, they start, oh, they, they, if you watch closely, they start running out of the bathroom before he comes out of the stall. Because they know he's in the stall. Either way, they all leave, and the yeah, one this, guy, this was a good moment for him. I like the one guy next to Bob who pissed himself to get out of there quickly. <laughs> oh, that's right. That was the very first scene that they filmed. The one in the bathroom? The one in the bathroom. Fun. Cool. So RoboCop has his nightmare, and then he decides he's going to go out on, on patrol because he's just got to get out. Uh, I don't know what, but he gets out, and then in the hallway, he's confronted by Lewis, and she asks him, what's your name? Yeah, because she saw him twirl the gun, and she recognized that being Murphy, um, potentially. But I think it yeah. was—I think it was the face-to-face. And then when RoboCop says, "Can I help you, Officer Lewis?" I, I think she probably also heard it in his voice as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can see that. And then so RoboCop goes out on patrol, and this is—you uh, know—he's doing his thing, and in the meantime. Uh, a meal. He's, he's robbing holding a, a gas station. Yeah. And, uh, he, he walks up with his Uzi points it in the little slot and says, give me all your money and fill up on number seven. <laughs> Why not get the gas too? Mm-hmm. And then, uh, Robocop sees what's going on. He recognizes him. It sparks another memory. Um, and then Emil blows up the fucking gas station. Well, before that, uh, RoboCop, I think for the second time, says, you know, you're coming with me, dead or alive. Yeah, dead or and alive. That's when Emil responds with, I know I know you. We killed you. And I think that's what sparks his memory. Oh, yeah, you're right. Speaking of sparks, that with that explosion, the explosion happens a lot bigger than what they, the, than the director had anticipated. The frustration of the crew made them say, well, you want a big explosion? All right, and we'll give you a big explosion. And so the fireball being as big as it was, I guess it blew out windows for blocks around, and a lot of people complained to the to uh, the officials about how obnoxious that explosion was because it did so much 
uh, damage to surrounding uh, neighborhood uh, buildings. I guess this was filmed in Dallas, Texas. And because of this scene, they rewrote the laws. You can't film like that anymore. You can't do explosions like that in, in those areas. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Yeah, groundbreaking. So then RoboCop he- heads back to the police station, and he decides to do a little bit of research. And the research that he does when that spike comes out. His data spike. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Did that make you think of, what, what did that remind you of? Or John, did that remind you of anything? Wolverine a little bit. A little bit. For, for me, it, it, it made me think of the Matrix, how the spike goes into the back of your uh, neck. And that was how you got your data. I I found it reminiscent of that. Now, granted, Matrix hadn't come out yet, but that was that was a cool aspect. But um, the way that he put his hand up to uh, the console that was very Star Wars, you know, he because he would he would turn his arm, his wrist, very Freudian. And yeah, then, so he figures out that he is Murphy, and he wants to find out more, and so he goes and tours his old house. That happens to be on the market. Yeah, but why is it so dirty? That is a really curious thing. The house is on, but then again, this is Detroit, and Detroit is a very, very tired old city that is very much on the brink of collapse. Yeah, but why are there burnt pictures of his old family there? I'm guessing that they kind of had robotic, you know, real estate people there. And you're absolutely right, Professor, who's buying housing in Detroit? People have probably come in and destroyed the place. Because you see all that garbage on the counters and stuff like that. How, how do you show a house having garbage on the counters? Well, it's not even that. It's you're, you're trying to give an emotional moment to this robot who is remembering his family. And you know what? How much does that fucking suck, right? You're dead, pretty much. And now you're a robot. You don't sleep. You don't eat. You don't do anything. You just fight crime. And now you have all of these flashbacks, and the the filmmakers are trying to give us this emotional moment. And for me, it just gets uh, lessened. The, the emotional moment is lessened because of the set decoration and the decisions that these guys made to make the apartment look the way it did. Because I was more focused on that than him remembering anything or him feeling anything. Did you catch the comic book reference in one of the memories? The ROM? There was actually two. There was Iron Man. These were actually in the mom and pop store as well as in the flashback with the kid. But yeah, you're absolutely right. ROM the Space Knight. Have you ever read that comic? No, but I remember them. I remember the toy. Yeah. I remember the robot. I actually had the comic books for ROM. Basically, that was a story of a humanoid type character who basically to save his planet has his brain transport or transplanted into a robotic body. Yeah. From here, RoboCop goes and he visits the nightclub and he is looking for a suspect, Leon. Does he find him? He does find him. And he is, uh, he, Leon immediately brandishes a gun, which RoboCop slaps away. And then from there, he goes to kick him in the privates, but it's just metal and he hurts his foot. And then RoboCop grabs him by the hair and drags him out. Did you catch a cameo in that dance club scene? I did not. The director was one of the dancers that was dancing all crazy. He actually wanted to show the other actors in that scene how they should be dancing, that they should be dancing all crazy and wild. And so he was out there kind of flailing his arms around. They filmed it and put it in the movie, and he didn't even know they were going to do that. Well, there you go. Next scene is we are at Morton, Morton's place, where he is hosting two guests. I, I dug this scene, and the reason why I dug the scene, no, not because of the cocaine and hookers. The although, decadence. Yeah, although it wasn't, you know, bad. Uh, but when Bodeker gets there, I love what he says. Bitches leave. And just so matter of fact. And then that one chick was like, Bob, don't forget to call me. And I'm thinking, this motherfucker's dead. He ain't calling shit. <laughs> but what I dug about this scene is the way Bodeker toys with him. Shoots him in the legs, plays the video, and that message is kind of fucked up, right? I mean, you you mess with the bull, you get the horns, essentially, is what he's saying. And uh, then he leaves the grenade, and God, could you imagine trying to get to that grenade, and you're almost there, but then you're not, and then it's over. I mean, that that's, that's a fucked up way to go. I'm cashing you out, Bob. Yeah. Kurt Wood Smith admitted that this was one of the hardest scenes for him to film, because he was laughing his ass off 
every time they filmed it because the director kept referring to the women by their names, which was bitches. Oh, really? So he was directing them, bitches move, bitches go to the left, bitches... And he just said he couldn't keep a straight face during this scene. Oh, fucking 80s. I want to know what type of a hand grenade that was because that was a big boom. Well, not only that, but it had a timer on it. Did you see that? Yeah, a digital timer. Yeah, because uh, Boddicker, he was so... uh, he was so casual about removing the pin, gets his tongue up through it, and then eventually pulls it out with his teeth, and he puts it down on the table, and he just casually walks. No, yeah. no urgency. Yeah. Well, clearly he got it from Dick Jones, right? Because yeah. we find we come to find out that Dick Jones has an arsenal somewhere. So, but yeah. that, that's that's a big fucking boom for a grenade. Oh, it fucking was for sure. This kind of harkens back with this reveal that he's working with Dick Jones harkens back to something that's said in the van earlier on in the scene. Did you catch the line that was said there? No. We steal the money, but we never get to keep the money. And that's because it's now become apparent Dick Jones has hired them to cause all this crime and to rob all these banks and all of this stuff just to cause chaos so that they can own Detroit. He's keeping all the money. He's keeping all the assets and everything. Yeah, I mean, he's the bad guy. That yeah. makes sense. So makes it, sense. it starts to make the story a little more complex, I think. No, it doesn't. Um, <laughs> Robocop, uh, we've, he tracks down Boddicker, and he is going to arrest him. And uh, Boddicker immediately gives up Dick Jones. Well, what do you think? First of all, what do you think of this whole scene with, in the cocaine factory? It was an action scene. Boddicker and Sal... What did you think of Boddicker when he puts his fingers into the glass of wine and sniffs it? That's weird. That was weird. That was fucking weird. I wonder mm-hmm. if that was ad-libbed. Do you think that was ad-libbed? He, I wouldn't be surprised if it was. The um, The following scene when Boddicker is at the police station, he asked Verhoeven, because it wasn't in the script, can I spit blood onto the, the paperwork? And, and yeah. So I, I wouldn't be a bit surprised if he did that because the uh, um, the whole uh, the whole Boddicker experience, Kurtwood Smith, isn't that his name? Mm-hmm. Yeah. He really enjoyed playing Boddicker because he is such a delightfully, you know, obnoxious person. He, he thought it was a really fun role to play. So I could see him ad-libbing numerous little things. It looked like he was having fun mm-hmm. playing that role. So yeah, RoboCop infiltrates the cocaine area, shoots everybody. And then um, come quietly or there will be trouble. Yes. Oh. And do you know where that line is directly lifted from? Another influence for this movie. Come quietly or there will be trouble. Mm-hmm. No. What is it? From the Judge Dredd comic books. Well, wow. Which I guess was an inspiration. In fact, if you look back like on the behind the scenes stuff or in the uh, making of that I was talking about, uh, the first costume that they had designed for RoboCop looked like Judge Dredd. Well, there you go. So here is another shootout that we get where we have no reloading. He shoots 17 different people without reloading. You know what? At this point, I, I don't care. And, you know, we there's going to be other movies on this list that we talk about in the near future that bullets are just a plenty. So in this type of thing, you just got to go with it, I guess. Pretty much. Yeah. I do know that this scene was meant to be a lot longer. It was supposed to be a a more uh, aggressive kind of action scene. But because of the uh, fake guns and all that jamming a lot and other technical issues, they just cut it down to be really quick. Yeah, and let's be honest. What more could you do? Mm -hmm. RoboCop's not throwing any roundhouses. He's not running after anybody. He's just going to shoot you. That's pretty much what he does. So, I mean... It was as long as it needed to be. The importance of the scene was really him catching up with Clarence and throwing him through all the windows. Oh, sure. sure. Uh, oh, there's a there's some unbroken glass. Yeah, well, he got a taste for it in the mom and pop shop. <laughs> he said, fuck, I could do this all night. And he does. And so uh, Clarence gives up Dick, Dick Jones. Jones. Mm-hmm. And so naturally, RoboCop goes after Dick Jones. And just the way Dick Jones is smiling and being all polite when RoboCop gets there, you knew he had something up his sleeve. Absolutely. Well, the funniest, I thought, th- the funniest thing about the scene is right before RoboCop arrives, Dick Jones is on the phone with Clarence. And he's telling him, 
don't say anything more. He records everything you say. He's got it in his files. And what does Dick Jones do when he kind of has RoboCop on the fence? Tells him everything. He tells him, I, I'm the one who killed Bob Morton. Yeah, yeah, crazy. Um, so RoboCop walks in. Uh, Dick, Dickie Jones is all smiley, and RoboCop goes to arrest him, and then Directive 4 kicks in. Here's my question. If Directive 4 is designed to shut you down whilst trying to arrest an official at OCP, why not wipe the memory too, right? Because then he wouldn't remember that he was wanted for a crime. Yeah, if the, if it immediately scrambled and erased everything, then they could just reload. Yeah, all it did was make it look like he had kryptonite around his neck. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it incapacitated him for a minute or two, couldn't really go through it. But if... So how does that work? Does RoboCop have to get away from him in order for everything to reset? Or does he have to have a, uh, uh, I don't want to say a feeling because he's a fucking robot, but I oh, think maybe he, I won't arrest him type of thing. Yeah, I think he has to basically stop arresting him for him to start functioning again. Yeah, but can he do that? Because it's against his prime directive. Uphold the peace. Serve justice. All that shit. I don't know. I had to kill Bob Morton because he made a mistake. Now it's time to erase that mistake. And we get Ed 209 again. Again. And here comes Ed 209. The big showdown. Mono e mono. All you have to do is go down steps. Mm-hmm. All you gotta do all you gotta do is go down steps and you win. <laughs> that that actually was put in there on purpose as a joke on corporate America and all this that they don't think about things like that. You know, they build this, you know, billion dollar robot thing. That can't even walk down steps. Yeah, well, they still do that to this day. Mm-hmm. Stuff gets made with no thought of uh, practical applications, mm-hmm. right? And now. really, I think Ed 209 was there for comedic effects because you notice as he falls down the stairs, what's the noise he makes when he lands? He's squealing like a pig. Kind of squealing like a pig, almost like a baby crying. So then RoboCop gets down to the, the car uh, parking lot to be surrounded by fellow officers who were just applauding him praising him not too long ago yep what fucking dicks well they were told that he's gone crazy and he's killing or he's trying to kill ocp executives so you know they trust him as a robot they don't know what's going on in his head yeah they're all assholes not showing any loyalty uh but there is one who is on his side his partner lewis Mm -hmm. and she picks him up uh rescues him Mm -hmm. if you will and then they go to a steel mill. They flee to the steel mill. Have we been here before the steel mill? It's the same steel Well, mill it looked like to me. One thing I wanted to bring up is when RoboCop escapes from the police officers, It to me, that I thought that was just a, a kind of a, you know, not really, I mean, it was a brilliant way to escape that was very subtle in that he just rolled down the different levels. And I thought, why don't we see that more in movies of people escaping from garages like that? They just roll down the levels. Well, I don't know. I thought that was just a clever way to get him out of that situation. Yeah, sure. But what I want to know is why go back to the steel mill? You know that's where the bad guys hang out, right? That's where he got mutilated. Mm -hmm. Why are we going back there? Well, I'm guessing the bad guys aren't there anymore. Yeah, it just it just seemed like a weird choice, and me. maybe that'll spark some more memories and help because slowly he's now getting his humanity back. Yeah, I mean he has to take off his mask, you know, mm-hmm. to get did you, uh, did you like did you like the screws coming out of his the side of his head? Yeah, it was good practical effects. I like that. What did you think of the line that we get when Murphy is talking about his family? He says that I can feel them, but I can't remember them. I thought that was an interesting line to have when uh, Lewis asks him about his family. Yeah. Well, he kind of starts off by saying, Murphy had a family. What happened to them? And she says, well, they moved on with their life. You know, they Mm -hmm. had to, you know, they went to the funeral and moved on. And so, yeah, he makes that comment. So it kind of starts showing that, you know, he, while he doesn't have the memories that he thinks like a robot, he basically feels like a human Mm -hmm. which i didn't know robots could do that well that's the whole point he's a cyborg and the one of the points the director wanted to make is that uh even if you turn you know human into a robot the humanity is going to win out in the end yeah well 
Angered by OCP's underfunding and short staffing, the police force goes on strike, and Detroit descends into chaos as riots break out through the city. Jones frees Boddicker and his remaining gang, arming them with high-powered weaponry to destroy Robocop. At the steel mill, Boddicker's men are quickly eliminated, but Lewis is badly injured and Robocop becoming trapped under steel girders. Even so, he kills Boddicker by stabbing him in the throat with his data spike. Robocop confronts Jones at OCP Tower during a board meeting, revealing the truth behind Morton's murder. Jones, in order to escape, takes the old man hostage, but is promptly fired from OCP, nullifying Directive 4 and allowing Robocop to shoot him. The old man compliments Robocop shooting and asks him his name. Robocop replies, Murphy, roll credits. All right, so the police force, they're angered. So they went on strike. And we get a crazy looking downtown. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Boddicker goes to Jones and says, um, you know, this is fucking crazy. What the fuck are we going to do? And Jones says, don't worry about it. I got some stuff for you that you're going to like. So we're introduced to these Cobra assault rifles, right? These big guns. Let me ask you a question. How come Ed 209 doesn't have one of those on his arm? I don't know. I thought his guns were pretty powerful. Ah, they were just fucking machine guns. Yeah. This thing was like a fucking missile launcher. Uh, something like that, I know. Um, I did kind of like the bit where uh, your, your laughing guy, your mm-hmm. favorite character, he comes up uh, in a car that's the same as Boddicker's. The 6000 SUX. Yeah. And he, <laughs> Boddicker goes, hey, guys, watch this. And he blows up the fucking car. Why? Because no one but Boddicker can have the cool car. So they have a tracking device, and it's off to the steel mill where it shows RoboCop to be. And this is our showdown. What would you guys think of this whole bit? I thought it was somewhat well done. I mean, he takes out that one guy really quick, uh, then gets the girders dropped on him in that whole puddle. Uh, but did you catch the, the next Jesus kind of reference of RoboCop walking on water? Um, no, I didn't, I didn't put the whole Jesus thing to it until I had heard about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, cause watching it never once did I think of any religious overtones Me neither. or undertones. Yeah. I guess it was all on purpose. He wanted yeah. it to have that allegory in it. Yeah. That's what, um, Paul Verhoeven thought of America mm-hmm. and religion. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So they're taking out the gang and giggles gets it first pretty easily. And then, um, What's that dude's name? Oh, Emil. Or, um, oh, yes. Emil, I think, got it the worst. And I, this was a scene that anytime I think of RoboCop, I always think about the melted man. Yeah, it's this one and then them shooting uh, Murphy in the beginning. Yeah. Right? It's these two scenes. This is pretty fucking brutal. Yeah, and he crashes into that, you know, toxic waste thing, comes out with the, you know, the skin just melting off of his hands and his face, and you can see the bone. The scene where he gets hit by the car, that was a crazy scene. They actually, you know, they filmed it just, I think, one or two times, but they had been saving up all the rotting food from, like, craft services to be able to throw onto the car as, you know, drove by. And the skull actually rolls up the car. They were lucky they got that scene to work. Rolls up the car and everything. It's one of the most brutal death scenes I think I've seen in a lot of movies. Uh, Yeah. It's it's certainly surprising. It's certainly when it happens, you go, oh, <laughs> and then you kind of giggle. At least I did. It was, uh, it, it was great, great practical effects. Yeah, it was one right? of those oh crap scenes to me. Oh, sure. Now, I sure. guess like when he when Emil kind of comes up on one of the bad guys, one of the henchmen, I can't remember what the guy's name Leon. is. Leon. Leon. And you see the surprise look. That's because none of them had seen Emil in the makeup. That was the first time they got to see him. Yeah, yeah, you'll find that a lot of movies will do that. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Well, hold on to something, and then the actors see it for the first time on set because they want that genuine reaction. Genuine reaction. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Boddicker is trying to escape. He's in his car. Lewis cuts him off, and then now uh, Boddicker shoots Lewis. Actually, wasn't it the guy up? Was it the guy? Guy up in the tower that shoots Lewis, or is it Boddicker? It's Boddicker. Oh, so it's Boddicker. Okay. Yeah, Boddicker shoots her. She falls down. The guy on the top, he goes to the magnet uh, crane thing. He's the one that drops the girders on mm-hmm. the RoboCop. How come his face doesn't get smashed? He's not wearing his helmet. Are you telling me it missed him? Guess so. Had to have, right? Lucky shot. 
That's what I think. And then, you know, he's all congratulating himself and patting himself on the back. And then, you know. Lewis. Classic. Right. She does one thing right in this whole film. She blows up Leon in the fucking uh, control room. Well, I guess the actress that played Lewis, uh, you know, they told her that she was going to have to crawl through this horrible water. I guess it was just really nasty and really cold. And they offered to put a wetsuit on underneath her outfit you know, underneath her costume she thought it would make her look fat so she refused so she almost got hyperthermia crawling through that water hey people do what they do for their art yeah she really regretted it and so uh this is where Boddicker comes up and uh robocop is pinned and trapped and he rams the data he, spike no uh Boddicker stabs oh, robocop yeah with a piece of rebar yeah, through, probably through bulletproof armor. Well, I think there was already a hole in him. That's what I, I looked at that scene a couple of times, yeah, and there was already a tear in the armor where he stabs him. Okay, all right, maybe I'll buy that. And then this is where we get uh, the data spike in the neck. Did you get the significance of the data spike to the neck? No. What hand did Clarence shoot off? Uh, his his right, right hand. hand. It was the same hand with the data spike. He's mostly right-handed, I guess. I, that's that's what I... Huh, well, I don't know. He's a fucking robot, right? Yeah. He should be ambidextrous. Yeah. <laughs> Do you use your left hand or right hand for that? And uh, that, that was quite the squirt of blood coming out. That And I, I was going to comment on that, too. Uh, it it kind of just plops on RoboCop's chest. And yeah. Like, oh, oh wow. That's yeah. A that, was a, that was a major splash. That's a lot of blood. And so he gets free. RoboCop does. Would you say that that's... He has to, would you say, first of all... One of our requirements are oh crap deaths for our villains. Would you say that was an oh crap death for our villain? For Clarence? For Clarence getting stabbed in the neck like no, that? Oh. Not at all. Not at all. Uh, the oh crap death goes to... Emil. Yeah. Emil? Yeah. Okay. Cross the windshield. Yeah. So RoboCop goes to OCP Tower, and during uh, a board meeting, he goes in and... Uh, well, he attempts to go in. When he gets there, Ed 209 is waiting for him and so but, you, since since robocop doesn't have any stairs around to throw at 209 down he takes the fucking cobra assault rifle mm-hmm. and just blows that 209 to pieces well the f- yeah I mean, that's pretty easy right yeah yeah okay so yeah. uh he goes upstairs and there's a board meeting and he exposes dick jones for the asshole that he is and so dick jones takes the old man hostage and i'm thinking to myself why not just fire the fucker right and he does well this this is what i was bringing up earlier about foreshadowing is just like the mayor had taken hostages now dick jones is grabbing the old man as a hostage so that's why i said it's kind of leading up to mayor went out the window dick jones is going out the window no yeah i guess there could be correlations there i liked how the boardroom still had a handgun in there what the hell is a handgun doing in the boardroom? In the same box, right? It was the same yeah. one that got that homeboy killed. Dick, you're fired. Thank you. And then he shoots him, and he Hans Gruber's out the window, and... This had to be... Uh, if you watched it closely, I figured that this was the scene that was the biggest annoyance to you, Don. Oh, it fucking drove me up the fucking wall. What, what specifically was it? The scene where he falls out the window. But did you catch as he's falling... What's wrong with this scene? Yeah, he has Freddy fucking Krueger arms. <laughs> yes, his arms are way extended out. And I don't know why they would have even left that in. Nah, maybe they ran out of time. Who knows why madmen do what they do? I mean, it, it's so comical at that point. So just takes you out of the movie that, again, that was just a huge negative for everything else that we had just seen. Yeah, well, I mean, I wasn't super impressed up until that moment. And so that moment just, you know, whatever mm-hmm. is what it is. And then uh, the day is saved, and this part's a nice little wink. Uh, the old man looks at him and says, nice shooting kid. What's your name? Turns around, Murphy. And then it just ends. Yep. One of the things I was going to bring up is I guess there was another scene shot, uh, and I don't know if it takes place before this scene or probably after this scene, that RoboCop visits Lewis in the hospital that shows She's still alive, and she is not becoming the next, like, female RoboCop. Oh, that's if the, <laughs> that's where uh, I could have swore that's where it was going, right? Mm-hmm. And I'm A lot sho- of people thought I'm that. I'm shocked Hollywood didn't do it. 
Let's mm-hmm. make a female RoboCop, and then they can, and then the third one will have RoboCop babies, and this, that, and the other. And Ed Two Hundred Nine can be the nanny. Fuck, this thing writes itself, guys. Speaking of trilogies, oh, oh fuck. And now it's time for John's. Moment. First, I need to clarify that whether you like it or not, RoboCop is something of a trilogy, much like Lord of the Rings. And this is the point in the podcast that I like to compare whatever movie we're reviewing to the greatest movie series ever made, Lord of the Rings. So let's first look at the different elements of RoboCop and compare it to Lord of the Rings. Middle Earth? Well, that's got to be old Detroit. Mordor? I would say that that's the OCP building, and Mount Doom is that OCP boardroom. And I'll get more to that in a sec. Now let's look at the Fellowship. The Fellowship is made up of Murphy slash Robocop, Lewis, Sergeant Reed, Bob, and the scientists slash engineers that work on and work on and rebuild Robocop. Frodo, typical as typical, it's our main hero. It's Alex Murphy, Robocop. Sam, pretty obvious, that's Ann Lewis. That's his partner. That's the one who's there to support him, you know, and helps him start to find his humanity and helps him along his journey. Aragorn, I'm going to pick Sergeant Reed for that. He's the one that works hard to keep everyone together and is the leader in the movie. Boromir, for Boromir, I'm picking Bob Morton. While he helps RoboCop, he also has his own agenda and wants the power for himself. And like Boromir, Bob is killed by an Urukai. So who is the Urukai? That's Clarence Boddicker. He does the soldier work for his boss. The orcs are his henchmen, Emil, Leon, and others. The Urukai works taking his orders from Saruman the White, who is Dick Jones. Dick works for OCP, but also has his own agenda and his own soldiers. Ultimately, he wants to take the power from, Sa- from Sauron, who happens to be the old man. The old man watches everything from OCP. Basically, he is OCP. And if you look at the OCP logo, doesn't it kind of look like an eye? He appears mostly okay in the first movie, but if you watch the rest of the movies, the other two, he later reveals that he is pretty much the big bad in the movie. So what is the precious? What is that one ring? It's the OCP programming that overrides Murphy's humanity. At first, it seems beneficial for RoboCop. His targeting is better, and he functions as a more efficient officer. But just like how Frodo becomes invisible when he puts the ring on, Murphy at, at first is unstoppable when he becomes RoboCop, but his programming blocks his humanity and later hinders him from doing his job when the directive blocks him from arresting Dick Jones. He fights it with his programming for the rest of the movie, and while he makes some progress against it in this movie, it's really not until a future movie that he truly overcomes his programming and destroys the One Ring, or at least destroys those directives. The closest he comes to destroying this ring in this movie is when he announces at the end that he's Murphy. That's the point that's supposed to represent he has achieved his humanity. So that is my comparison of Lord of the Rings to RoboCop. Bring on the grades. Mm. Frodo and Sam, they were uh, very, very obvious. But after that, mm. I don't know. I, uh, you know, Saruman, I, 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 I kind of, I, I didn't agree with uh, Boddicker being the Arakai. And I can see what you're saying about uh, Morton being Boromir, but I, I, I don't know. I, I just, I was really tough last week. You know, I couldn't decide, is it going to be a B plus or a C minus? And I think I went with B minus last time. This, I, I thought it would be stronger, but it doesn't feel as strong. I'm going to go C plus this time. C plus. I actually like the Boromir correlation uh, because Boromir starts off as a dick and it's actually almost reverse Boromir, right? Because Boromir uh, ends a hero or dies a hero. Uh, Bob Morton dies a shithead, you know, but Boromir's mission was to see that the ring get destroyed. 
You know, he, he says that at the thingamadoodle. Uh, Gondor will see it done and Bob is creating RoboCop to advance his career and you know I guess make things better you know I mean he is supposed to be a good cop right so I did like that one uh the Urukai and um uh Bodeker being the Uruk uh, him and his gang being the Urukai I, I I could see that too because they were just henchmen and that's mm-hmm. all the Urukai were were just henchmen yeah, it, I mean, it wasn't a bad correlation. I think I'd rather watch that movie than the movie I actually did watch. So for that, my friend, I'm going to give you a B minus. B minus. Can I just point out one thing? Uh, if you remember Boromir, when he was going after Frodo, he kept saying, Gondor can do a lot with the ring. We could win if we had the ring. He wasn't talking at that point about destroying the ring, which I thought was similar to Bob really just wanted to basically be number two at the company. He wanted to be under the old man. Sure. He wanted to get rid of stones. So really he wanted power just like Boromir was being taken over by the influence of the ring and wanted the power. The other thing I thought, maybe I get a little bit of bonus points by the fact of that I kind of built a hierarchy in this one. And I thought it was a kind of a clever connection of, you know, old man as as Sauron, then Sauron the White, followed by who works for Sauron the Right, the Urukai and the Urukai who killed Boromir, so Clarence killed Bob. So I thought maybe I'd get some bonus points with that one. Yeah, no. Okay. And that was John's. Moment. All right, what do you guys think? You guys ready to rate this bitch? I think we should rate this bitch. I think um, if we're going to rate this bitch, Don, I'm going to want you to go first. Well... Take want and put it in one hand and take a big pile of shit and put it in the other hand and tell me which one fills up first. And speaking of shit in my hand, uh, how do we do our ratings? <laughs> what is that? that? has nothing to do with the ratings. Our ratings are not based on shits. What the fuck? Fuck that guy. What are they based on, Professor? We do our ratings on a scale of one to five fucks. Five fucks is a movie that we think is cinematic gold. In this example, we would be ready to watch it anytime somebody said, you want to watch that? Yes, I do. A one fuck movie is going to be a movie that it's one and done. You've seen it and you have no desire to see any of it again. Nothing is appealing about it. And for whatever reason, just, no, I'm never, I'm never going to see that movie again. All right. And what's a zero? A zero fuck movie is... You owe me two hours of my life back. Fuck you for making me watch that. Or in other words, we just don't give a fuck. Um, all right, fuckers, I'll go first. Well, you've been poo-pooing all evening long, and I'm curious to hear what it is that it that just makes it just so negative for you. All right, so RoboCop. I remember seeing this back when it came out on video, and I remember not being all that hugely impressed. Uh, I wasn't a big fan of Peter Weller. Uh, I wasn't a big fan of Nancy Allen and the story is the story is fundamental and the effects at the time were good. The violence, I don't, I mean, violence is violence and did it go overboard? Maybe. Um, But there was just something about the way RoboCop was portrayed and it was the way that, everything just was stitched together. I, it just didn't connect with me. I didn't, I didn't buy the character of RoboCop from the beginning and I didn't buy it at the end. They tried to do an emotional arc and give us some emotion, but they didn't, I don't know. To me, they didn't take the care in really trying to develop it. They gave it to us in a lot of flashbacks and I get it. He's fucking dead. Right. But I think there were more questions that I had after this movie than answers um if that makes any sense uh why i mean how is he still alive why does the house look like that and and you can do that for any movie you want and i guess that if i'm not invested with the main character to begin with it's going to be a hard sell to the end luckily for me this movie was only an hour and 40 minutes right and in that i think it's still 10 minutes too long but that's just me um, looking at the movies that we put on our list and, and even our individual lists. And I said this earlier, RoboCop is toward the bottom for me. And it, it's just because I've just never really liked the movie. And so 
you know, putting it on our list that we have now and looking at the movies that we already reviewed, uh, I think the only movie that I might not watch before RoboCop is Lone Wolf McQuaid. So with all of that being said, I'm giving RoboCop 2.75 fucks. That's higher than I thought you were going to give it. I, I thought he'd give much lower as well. Did you ever see the sequel? No. Oh, don't, yep. yeah. you don't need to see him. I have no desire to. It's lame. Yeah. All right. Who wants to go next? Which one of you joygasms want to give it? It's 4.25s and move on. 4.25? That seems low. <laughs> I knew you were going <laughs> to fucking say that. Shit. I'm happy to go next. Does RoboCop deliver on our must-haves for a classic 80s action movie? A strong hero with quotable one-liners. I definitely had a strong hero. I don't know if the one-liners were as quotable, as memorable as some of our other movies. Definitely the dead or alive, you're coming with me. That's the one everybody I think thinks of when they think of RoboCop. As for the other ones, the only other one I can think of is I'll buy that for a dollar. Crazy level supervillain that only our hero can beat. Not sure if I would call either Clarence or Dick like a supervillain, but they definitely were evil and they were portrayed really well in their roles. Chase and fight scenes. Well, we get an early chase scene. Definitely a lot of shootouts. A final showdown. We actually get kind of two final showdowns with the death of Clarence and the death of Dick. An oh crap death scene. Emile's definitely was the big oh crap scene of this, you know, of this movie with the melted man hitting the car. Um, I also kind of feel like Clarence getting stabbed in the neck with the data thing. When I first saw this movie, I didn't see that coming. So I thought that was kind of oh crap. I expected to be a bigger fight. Franchise potential. This movie did spawn two sequels that were horrible. A reboot that we won't even talk about. It had a live action series, I believe 22 episodes, two animated series, a whole toy line, shampoos, everything. This movie was all over the place. They're even talking about doing a prequel series right now that follows a young Dick Jones and his basically uh, his starting to work at OCP and moving up the ranks. So it's still all over the place and people are still talking about it. And it came in at about a 102-minute runtime, which gets close to our 90-minute requirement. RoboCop goes beyond a typical sci-fi action movie. The director makes a statement about capitalism, technology, versus humanity. We get a man who becomes a machine, but in the end, it's his humanity that wins. It redefines what sci-fi action movies at that time could be. It gave us an action movie with gore, humor, and heart in kind of a schlock type movie. Not what you would expect from a film titled RoboCop. Seeing that title alone, you'd almost think it'd be something like RoboShark or Robo... Something that would just go straight to video and wouldn't be worth your time. Thanks to a semi-decent script, lots of actions, clever allegories, and a splash of humor... And I didn't think Peter Weller did too bad. Not only did this movie work, but it became a cult classic. Personally, I can't see talking about classic 80 action movies without at least bringing up RoboCop and its influence on so many movies that came after it. The only negatives I have regarding this movie is that without the use of CGI, some serious scenes came out looking very poorly done, like Dick falling out the window with his Freddy Krueger arms, and some of the painted backgrounds looked painted. They didn't look very realistic. Plus, the stop you know, animation, while I appreciate what they were going for, in some ways, especially when you watch it today, looks very fake. And while my generation can appreciate the stop motion and the painted backgrounds, I'm not sure if it holds up to today's audience who are seeing it for the first time. For all those reasons, I'm giving RoboCop 3.75 fucks. 3.75 fucks from the comic book guy. All right, Professor, you're up. RoboCop is a movie that I associate very strongly, very strongly with the 80s. And it was a movie that had a lot of lines in it that linger inside my head to this day. 
it's it's not unusual to have these occasional lines that might come up. And I don't necessarily say them out loud, but I hear them a lot in my head. Bitches leave. <laughs> Fucking love that one. Um, I, Dick, I'm very disappointed. You know, th- there's lots of little lines in here that uh, that I, I, I am still nostalgic over. The action is... Uh, its own action because I think of the explosions and the gunfire. And it certainly has a level of uh, violence to it that is uh, startling, courtesy of Paul Verhoeven and his vision of more, more, more. I, I'm not opposed to that at all. And I, uh, I myself think that uh, Officer Lewis works. I, I dug the character in the movie. She, she works for me. I also thought that uh, Dick Jones, played by Ronnie Cox, was a delightful uh, representation of a corporate, you know, head, a, a head honcho corporate that is very, very uh, evil. And I loved how ferocious he comes across being in a three piece suit. I also uh, really dug how RoboCop had uh, his own uh, movements. I thought that he moved well. The costume looks good. And in general, I, I found the movie to be, you know, enjoyable to watch. Still, I hadn't seen it in several years, and I think that it is a good representation of the 80s excess that it was lampooning. The black humor of the movie works for me. It, I thought that it is uh, an amusing trope that is giving us just how ridiculous some things about our society and culture are. And it's done in a, a bombastic way that I wasn't opposed to. For the most part, I think that it's a fun watch. The CGI would have been appreciated. The practical effects that they had in there were good, but the, the stop motion, it feels dated. And it, it does look good, but it doesn't look great. But, you know, it's a movie that's, you know, almost 40 years old. So, you know, it's going to be, that's to be expected. And you just have to accept that. I think that this movie is 3.25 fucks. All right, with the scores of 3.25 from The Professor, 3.75 from The Comic Book Buy, and 2.75 from myself, that gives us an average of a 3.25 fucks, which ties it in the lead with Roadhouse. Roadhouse. Uh, to me, that feels about right. I would oh. agree with that. Well, of course you two would. So let me ask you guys this. Uh, what do you think of all the segments with the I'll buy that for a dollar guy? I'd buy that for a dollar. I didn't get it. Did you get it? Well, he was supposed to be a take on Benny Hill. Which he totally felt like. Yeah, and he was supposed to be kind of another statement on corporate America saying that I'd buy that for a dollar. There was supposed to be a fourth scene that they did not show which was actually going to be a part of the news segment to show that he was being arrested for sexual harassment the actor cool the other thing about that was and i don't know if the director got the reference or just didn't care but the program was called that's not my problem and do you know why that that program was called not my problem no i got a better question well, I'm going to answer it anyway. Uh, the reason why they called that segment, it's not my problem, is because every time someone went to the director and said that they had a problem with something or an issue with something, that was his same response every time. That's not my problem. Cool. So what about the cage match? Now we have well, RoboCop in the cage match. No weapons. No weapons. So Cobra doesn't get a weapon either then. No. Why no. are you so fucking concerned with Cobra having a weapon? This because I the think... Sugar, the two, two weeks in a row, we keep telling you it's hand-to-hand combat. I know, but if you take strengths of different characters, I do, that, Cobra, one of his strengths was his, you know, Cobra gun that uh, he uses. I, I, I think same one, with Robocop. One of, yeah, but not the only. Yeah. I, think, I think he was very much a hand-to-hand uh, fighter. Could he take Dalton? Depends. I, I think that they quickly have to decide that they all need to gang up on RoboCop first. Just knock him on his back. Well, that's when when you said that, and I started thinking, oh, what about the cage match? Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. If you can get RoboCop on his back, because he's the one that I would think 
would be the invincible one. Right? How do you puncture him? How do you... But he's so slow. You take a gun out of his hand. He moves so slow. You just keep away from him in the cage, depending on how big the cage is. Yeah. I, and I, then eventually... I buy, I buy that too. Knock him over. Okay, but eventually you're, you're going to get tired and you're, you're going to want him. So here's... So he... <laughs> Better alive. You're coming with me. Here's what happens. Okay? Uh, they lure Robocop into the center uh, by chanting, Kumate. Kumite, right? And then Ben Richards gets on all fours behind him. <laughs> and you get three. And both. No, three. Uh, you get McQuaid. And you, get D- D- you get Dukes and, and, and McQuaid. And, all and uh, Roundhouse kicking him. Yeah, yeah. Dukes, McQuaid, and Dalton. They No, just straight on kick. Mr. And he flies <laughs> over, falls onto his back, and then Cobra leans over him and says, You're the disease. Dumb to cure and just steps on his face. Game over. So I think Duke still wins. If they get rid of Robocop, then yeah. All right. Uh, I think that is going to wrap it up for this episode of Three Guys in a Flick. If you want to know which 80s classic movie we are going to review next, be sure to check out the website and any social media that we are on. Speaking of which, hey, John, where can they find us? Well, as always, they can find us at our website, threeguysatafflick.com, where we post our show notes, all of our podcasts, as well as some other movie trivia and other interesting facts. You can find us, as you said, Don, on any social media, as well as any place that has uh, podcasts available. All right. Sounds good. I just want to thank Zach, Ronnie, and Jill for always listening. Thanks, Zach. Thanks, Ronnie. Thanks, Jill. And thank you to everyone else who listens to us as well. I also want to send out a shout out to anyone who attended uh, the Emerald City Comic Con and attended our panel. Thank you for showing up. We really appreciate it. And we had a lot of fun doing that. So hopefully we'll see you next year. For Three Guys on a Flick, I'm Don. I'm John. And I'm Ken. Thank you for your cooperation. feel like you were singing that electric company song. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Was that electric company or system street? It was on the show called electric company. Yeah. That's what I just asked you. Don't roll your eyes at me. I, because I'm, not, I'm, I'm the fucking... one to say it, not you. That's why you were flipping them off. I was trying to figure out why you were flipping them off. Well, I did too, but I was already halfway through my spiel. <laughs> but he didn't tell us that that's the line you wanted. <clears throat> no, he didn't. He didn't communicate. <laughs> you know why? You quit looking at me in the eye. You're making me uh, really uncomfortable here, buddy. Ronnie Cox is good. But, you know, Cox is always good. Right, John? I don't know what you're talking about. I'm sure you don't. Buddy. That was some low-hanging fruit. He had to steer away from it because he wanted to bite into that apple. Oh, he likes to bite. <laughs> yep. Oh, he <sighs> likes to bite. <laughs> Robochop. Robochop. I think there was actually a Robo Chop, an infomercial. And that doesn't surprise no, me. No, it was a slap chop. I think there was a Robo Chop too. With I think it was Robo Cock. That's, <laughs> that's the what I think. Name. That's what I think it was. Robo Cock tracks down the. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've never done cocaine, but I always imagined that if I was going to do cocaine, it would have been in between uh, two pairs of breasts. If you want, go get it and I'll, I'll put it on my chest for you. All right. Uh, I was going to say, Professor, go give me some cocaine. <laughs> I want to try I, me some of that cocaine. Why would I have cocaine? Because you're the professor. It's in the fucking name. Sorry, listeners. All right, fuck off. Good night.